suicide is defined as intentional act of taking one's life. Now, for me as a therapist, I have a problem with the word intentional. My name is Silas. I am a consultant counseling psychologist and the CEO of Amazon Counseling Center. At Amazon Counseling Center, we provide psychological services to individuals, like specifically people who come for therapy, but also we do a lot of uh, corporate training, embassies here and there, and other corporate, uh, basically on mental wellness. Now, today I will be specifically uh, talking about suicide and suicidal prevention, particularly because this month is a month that we, as mental health uh, organizations or mental health sector, we focus much more on uh, suicide and suicide, suicide prevention. And uh, I know also suicide is a very uh, sensitive uh, issue that happens really in our lives, and sometimes we don't know how to deal with it. And I know even as I will be speaking, I'm just probably questioning a little bit. You may have been through this, you have maybe attempted, maybe you're going through psychological uh, ideations regarding uh, suicide, or probably a family member may have committed suicide, or a family member is uh, struggling with suicidal thoughts. Uh, I, I know all those things can re-traumatize you, can actually uh, cause a lot of negative emotions and even negative thoughts. I just want to prepare you even as I begin. However, as I go on, I know I will consider giving you tips or maybe uh, uh, preventive uh, or prevention uh, factors that you can involve yourself in just to be able to remain stable and also to heal. Now, suicide is defined as intentional act of taking one's life. Now, for me as a therapist, I have a problem with the word intentional. Because intentional looks like you actually sat down and you made a decision that you're going to kill yourself. Now, not so many people actually do that. Oftentimes, suicide comes as a very complex kind of a state that even to be able to uh, figure out your way out of that uh, complexity becomes very difficult. And that's why it's not really good for any one of us to just make a judgment on someone who is suicidal or someone who has attempted suicide. Because when it comes to human will or intentionality, there are a couple of things that we need to consider. One of the major things that we consider is the level of intentionality. Like, were you really like, intentionally aware of the consequences? of the suicide itself that you're going to, uh, to get yourself into. Number two, we also want to consider, were you forced by whatever force, either uh, a force from within or a force from outside? You know, were you under pressure of whatever form? Were you in a, probably an emotional intensity, maybe under drug uh, or substance influence? Were you in a state that you felt your life was threatened and therefore the only way was to take your life? So we need to consider all these factors so that at least we are able to tell that someone was intentional about suicide. But oftentimes even what we hear from people who come and share with me who have survived suicide, they will always tell you that they did not want to die. Oftentimes people want to just escape from the pain that they are going through. Sometimes people are, are, are feeling so helpless and hopeless and worthless and feeling like they are burdened to other people and they, do not, they don't know what to do actually at that time. And so the only way they think is how they can exit out of life, but they never consider their consequences. They also do not consider that actually taking that action of suicide, you are going to exterminate your life completely and probably even leave other people suffering a lot. They are not aware of that because of the psychological torture that sometimes they are going through. Now, did you know that uh, 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 every 40 seconds we have one person committing suicide, actually dying of suicide? It's, it's really a big uh, statistics. You know, sometimes it may look like just number one, like one person. But we are talking about a human being, we are talking about a soul, we are talking about a father, we are talking about a mother, we are talking about a daughter, a son, you know? As someone who is quite prominent in the society, die, one, that one person dying is really a huge impact in the whole society. But also, uh, statistically, if you look at the global um, study on, uh, on suicide, uh, about seven or 3,000 people die yearly out of suicide. And particularly here in Kenya, we have about, uh, we, we have uh, roughly about 
you know, 6.1 people out of 100,000 dying of suicide in Kenya. And uh, among all these people, 15, aged 15 to 29, are the ones that actually mostly commit suicide and probably even those who survive are still within those years. Of course, there are many factors uh, that can um, explain why that happens, but all the same, uh, I'm not getting into that today. Now, it is also statistically um, proved that there are more men who commit suicide than women. Uh, we'll be talking about that later on. Actually, statistics in Kenya say that 70 to 75 percent of those who commit suicide or those who die of suicide are actually men, which is really a big statistic, you know. And, and so we will be diving into that as we, we share, we continue the sharing, so that at least we can tell the factors contributing to that. But generally, uh, when we talk of suicide, there are many factors that can lead into that. It's not just waking up one day and saying that I want to die or I want to exit. I want to just go and go and not come back. It's actually sometimes about a lot of other things happening. For example, it could be something that's psychological, something that is of environmental factor, something that is social, something that is spiritual, something that is biological. Like all these factors can actually contribute to someone getting to a place of suicide. Oh, I can break them down a little bit uh, so that you really understand keenly. One is trauma. When someone has been through painful and traumatic experiences, they get to a place of uh, helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, and they're experiencing a lot of flashbacks and mental torture. They try to sleep, they cannot, they're just getting flashbacks of the experience of pain that they have been through in life. Someone can get to a place that they are so helpless and the only thing they think about is suicide. The other factor is where someone has been through major losses in life. For example, you have lost the one who whom you loved, or you've lost uh, your father, or your, your mother, or your mentor, or someone, or a child, or someone who was very close to you, sometimes these are uh, difficult uh, experiences to process. And you know in Africa, generally, I usually say that Africa is, is made up of layers and layers of trauma. If you, if you look at it, even in this country particularly, you know, like for example, those who fought for Mamau, they shed a lot of blood. There are people who are imprisoned for life and they died even in prison. Those people left their families. So those families have carried the generation of pain through and through, and, and that pain really bothers them. So when someone has been through such losses, major losses, they can actually get to a place that they feel it's not necessary even for me to live. I've heard in therapy, people say, when I lost my grandmother, I thought maybe it, it, it would have bet, been better for me to die. Or when I lost my mother, I thought maybe it would have been better even my grandfather to die, you know, other than my mother. Meaning already they are thinking about the concept of death and almost like um, trying to begin who should have died and who should have not died. And so it, it tells you when someone has gone through major losses, they get to a place that life loses meaning and purpose and all they want is really to die. And that's how even suicidal ideations come in. Another factor that can contribute to this is lifestyle uh, pressures. Like for example, there is a economical pressures that we're going through right now. Maybe you've taken a loan uh, from um, uh, different uh, organizations and, and different, uh, I don't know how they call them, uh, all these, uh, you know, there are companies, many companies, even hubs that are coming and they're giving loans, you know. You have taken one loan here, another loan there, another loan the other, and Pesa, and Pesa, and Shari, and everything else. And at the end of it, or the day, all these people are calling you and they want you to give back their money. And the interests are so huge, you know, and you don't know how to deal with that situation. Sometimes you switch off your phone, but probably you get your daily bread through the phone. Maybe some people call you and give you a job. There is no way you can just go off completely. And so the moment you try and register, and register a new line, for some reason they fight you and they start calling you. Sometimes they are knocking at your door every morning. People probably have come and they are taking everything that you had. And so you can get to a place that you're so overwhelmed and the only way is to get out of uh, existence by committing suicide. Another factor that is really important is when someone has gone through painful experience that humiliate them or cause a lot of shame. Uh, those experiences also may sometimes make someone feel like they want to commit suicide. So these are just a few of the factors that I can mention and maybe how can I forget about uh, uh, maybe divorce, relationship issues. Uh, we have seen a lot of that happening. You get into a relationship you sacrificed everything. Maybe your parents were giving even a, a scholarship to go to study in another country. You sacrifice so that you can get married to someone. And then somewhere along the way they are cheating and not even cheating, they are probably uh, beating you up. 
And so the violence is too much, maybe the alcoholic and all those things happening, you feel abused and completely broken and you don't know how to move on with life. And so when it gets there, you lose meaning because you feel, I can't go back to my parents because already I told them, no, I don't want to study, I don't want to do anything, I want actually to go on and get married. Now, where will I go to? You know, traditionally people used to say, I'm going back home. Now, you can't go back home again because already in that area, you have already uh, destroyed the relationships there. And you know, sometimes when you get into relationships with such people who are manipulative, they manipulate you in a way that they make sure that they have cut you off completely from any support system. And so they are the ones who are now you are at their disposal and they can do with you whatever they want. And so when it gets there, you don't know who to talk to. Maybe you, are, you could be even a pastor, you know, you're running a church you know, even mentoring couples. And sometimes you don't know what to do because you can't tell anyone that your marriage is not working. And so when it gets there, uh, people think of suicide and sometimes even they go ahead and commit suicide. And the other thing also I think is important to mention is when someone has um, chronic illnesses, like for example, you have cancer and you're really going through a lot of pain. You've been told maybe you are stage four and you know that there's no remedy. Uh, people start wishing death and sometimes they actually go ahead and even commit suicide. So these are a few factors that I can think about. I know there are so many factors that uh, we can consider as causes of suicide. Now, having said that, I also want to say that uh, suicide is more, uh, more in men than in women. And uh, I just uh, identified a little earlier as I was sharing that uh, in Kenya particularly, 70 to 75% of the suicide committed uh, they are actually men who have committed the suicide. But also, again, is uh, statistics worldwide, uh, we say that there are two to four, two to more, men are uh, uh, two to four likely to commit suicide uh, more than, uh, than women. Uh, and that test is, is again a big number. And you would want to know what are the factors. Of course, there are obvious factors. Uh, for example, there is a lot of pressure put on men by the society in general. Because men are supposed to provide. You know, like for example, when I'm talking about stress, I, I define stress in a very simple way and a very interesting way. Stress is someone trying to repair every situation solo. Someone trying to repair every situation solo. So this is one man who is trying to repair every situation. For example, economically things are not doing so well. In the relationship things are not doing so well. Maybe he has healthy problems. Maybe at home uh, people are expecting uh, you to support them, like your uh, family of origin. Uh, maybe also at the same time you have a, a sick child. Uh, maybe you need to pay school fees and many other things that are happening at the same time. Though, so this is one, just one person who is over, um, um, banded and over, over, overwhelmed by all these experiences. And therefore someone can actually easily get into a place where they think of committing suicide. Number two is because men are, are not likely to seek help. Because again, of the, um, the stigma that is there with the mental illnesses. So if someone is going through a mental illness, let's say, for example, like suicide, I, I mean, and depression, or someone is going through uh, maybe schizophrenia, the, you know, oftentimes people look at them, mental illnesses, as behavior choice. Like, like, because again, the problem, the big problem we have in the society, and even in mental health, is that uh, mental illnesses manifest like behavior. So, for example, when someone is crying, a man who is crying because they have, they have uh, depression and uh, depression makes someone constantly cry, so you found yourself crying, you don't know how to present that to your, to your, to your family, for example. How will your wife perceive you? Will perceive you as a weak man. You're not able to face life. And so you can go to other men also and tell them that uh, you, you, you're unable to, to keep calm, as in you have this intrusive thought that you can't bed, sleep at night. You can't tell your, your, your friends that uh, you can't wake up to go and work, like you don't feel motivated to go and work. You know, they will look at you like a lazy man. And, and so that is one big problem that we have when it comes to mental illnesses because they manifest like behavior. And in our society, behavior also is categorized, you know. There's some good behavior, there's some bad behavior. And so when they see a sense of weakness, they immediately start attacking you instead of reaching out to actually help you and see why are you not motivated to go at work? Why are you crying the whole night? Why do you seem a, a bit more angered, like you, you have high, high, high temper or something like that? People do, will not focus on that. They will say, ah, you lend him to a sira. Oh, that, what, that guy is not good. He's always get angry. Don't be where they are. They can beat you up or whatever else. That's what people will tell you. But actually they don't realize there's someone who is struggling a lot in their, in their thoughts. So because they can't go to anyone for help, 
they actually decide and commit suicide. But also the other way is because men have more access to lethal uh, tools or weapons that are actually, uh, more than even women, that can be used for, for, for suicide. For example, it is more men who have gun than, than women. Uh, that's another factor that we know. And number two, also we know that men are likely to use, for example, a knife more than even women, because women fear pain generally. But men have been uh, cultured in such a manner that they don't have to be afraid of pain that much. I'm, I'm trying to consider like communities like, uh, communities like Meru, uh, where men are circumcised, you know, in a, like you put them together, like 50 of them, and they are circumcised without any treatment, without any medicine whatsoever, without anything at all. You know, going through all that pain. And the general struggles that men go through kind of harden them up. And so they can easily uh, commit suicide. And even access to, to poison, uh, pesticide is one of the things that are being used around here. Men can access that more. And probably even men have more money than women. Uh, I, that is probably something that people can debate. Uh, but all the same, they have more money. They can access, actually, what it is they want to use for, you know, to, to be able to complete the process of uh, uh, committing suicide. Another factor that would make men uh, commit suicide more than women is because of the masculinity part. Because masculinity part means men uh, are pressurized to be strong, are pressurized uh, to actually overcome everything. And, 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 and so, like when someone is going through a mental struggle and they cannot overcome that, then they feel weak and they can't tell anyone and therefore ultimately they end up committing suicide. But also more men use substance more than women. That one we know. And so when you are under the influence of suicide, I mean uh, of substance, you can easily uh, find yourself um, getting into a place we call uh, uh, substance use or substance induced psychosis or substance induced uh, depression or substance induced mental illness generally. And, and so when you get to that place, you can easily actually get to a place of committing suicide. And so that's another fact that makes men uh, to be more um, susceptible to uh, suicide than, than even um, uh, women. Now, the other factor that we need to consider is to ask, again, how can we come in and help? How can we support not only men, but the entire society? Because again, it's, 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 it's of no use for me to be here sharing about suicide and actually not go ahead and give people uh, some information how they can, first of all, identify and then prevent. So when you try to identify suicide, you know, most of us, we expect that someone will come and tell us that I want to commit suicide. Very few people will tell you that. But people will come with cues or statements like, I feel useless, I feel no one loves me, I feel rejected. I feel like um, I, I am a burden to people. I feel like I'm going through too much, I would rather be dead. Uh, or I want to go somewhere and be there for a very long time, switch off my phone and just sleep and never wake up again. So when you hear such statements, someone is actually telling you that they have gotten to a place of existential crisis. They are already wondering, why am I existing? And the only thing that they will get to, either they will tell you or not, is the suicidal thoughts. Uh, very few people will say that they are suicidal. And, and this is to mean that actually if we wanted them to prevent suicide, it's very easy because most people will speak and talk about it in that manner. So you only have to know when someone is suicidal by getting to understand those cues. They say actually 99% of those who commit suicide will have communicated in some way. Either they will have said, uh, maybe in the family setup, I know you guys, no one loves me, and I better not be part of this family. So when they say such a statement, already they are suicidal in a way. Maybe they haven't gotten to a place that they are thinking about it, but they're already experiencing existential struggles, and they don't know why they are part of that family. Now, having said that, I will also say now, when it comes to prevention, uh, we need to consider a couple of things. One, we need really, really uh, to create awareness and educate people so that people will know uh, what suicide is. And because once you know, you, are, you, you can prevent either someone else or you yourself, you'll know when you're suicidal. Especially when you get into those places that you're feeling like life has no meaning, you're feeling worthless, you're feeling a lot of shame, uh, you're feeling like uh, there's a sense of worthlessness or a burden to other people. When you get there, you know, the next move will be suicidal thoughts. And so once you know that, you'll be able to prevent either to speak up or reach out for, for help. Um, number two also, it is very important 
uh, to educate people on uh, stress management and conflict uh, resolution uh, skills. Because we have so many people uh, who would have prevented themselves from uh, dying out of suicide if they knew how to manage stress, if they knew how to manage conflict. Maybe they were in a very conflicting situation or they were going through a lot of suicide, a lot of stress, but they did not know how to handle that. So once we do those, they can be even programs actually even from primary school all the way uh, to the universities and wherever, workplaces and wherever we find ourselves, even in the churches, even the mosque, we can come up with a standards not only studies, information, or even books that are provided, or even talks that are provided for people to get to know when they are stressed up, first of all, to identify stress, to know where it comes from, and to know also how they react to it, and ultimately to know how they can prevent uh, themselves from stress. Not really preventing, but managing, because stress is something that um, ideally you cannot do without. We experience stress all the time, but it's just understanding how to be able to manage. And conflict resolution, because we live among people, and people have conflicting ideas, people have conflicting choices in life, you get married, you have figured it out, like this is how you're going to live your life, but then you get into marriage with someone else who has a weird idea about marriage. And so when you get in there, you don't know what to do. Or maybe you get into a workplace, and you're really excited to get into this new working place. And then you find people who have all manner of things, tribalism, things that you never expect, and bribes and everything else, and um, even sexual harassment at work. And so all these things are happening, and you don't know how to deal with that kind of conflict. But if someone actually was helped to deal with that, they don't have to get all the way to suicide. So that's another key factor. The other thing is also to be able to mobilize people to know that there is help. When you get to that place, there is help. And the help can come from therapists, particularly, uh, and I really encourage for that because sometimes we run to the pastors. I have no problem. That can be first stop before you go for therapy. Because even the pastor uh, ought to actually refer you for therapy. Because there's no conflict between spirituality and psychology, uh, especially when it comes to helping a human being. Because helping a human being, it has to be a holistic model that touches on their spiritual aspect, their social aspect, their psychological aspect, and uh, the biological presentation. We need to consider all these factors as we're helping someone. So if someone goes to the doctor and they have a medical problem, uh, maybe chronic illness, that is actually making them suicidal, the doctor might not be able, might treat the chronic problem, but might not be able to deal with a, with a mental problem, which is leading to suicide, suicidal. So that's why someone now needs to be referred to a psychiatrist for medicine, uh, if they have gotten to a place of psychosis, or they need to be referred to a psychologist who can generate with this person and try to see why are they getting impacted by this illness in such a manner that they feel like life is worthless and they need to actually get into a place of committing suicide. If they come for spiritual help, again, they tell you of these demons that are speaking to me. Sometimes they are not demons. It's actually voices that are speaking to them because they are psychotic already. So they are having what we call... Um, the ideations, they are having uh, what we call uh, hallucinations, uh, and so some are seeing things that no one else can see, or they are hearing things that no one can see. Maybe they are hearing a voice telling them, kill yourself, or you will die, you know, something like that. So if they, that's what they are going as a person, yes, you can pray for them, cast out the demons, but if you realize the demons are not going, refer them for psychiatric or, or for psychological uh, help. And then a psychologist will join with them and try to see where are these coming from. As they take their medicine maybe, and the, as you continue with the prayer, they are also here with a, a, a therapist. And probably a therapist also might refer you to a nutritionist because maybe also there are certain foods that you need to eat uh, so that you can be a, a bit more stable. So it's a holistic kind of a treatment plan that we need to have. So we need to mobilize people and get to know that this information is available for them. And once the information is available, they will make choices. And then also, I think as a country, we need to get to a place that we can have um, hotlines. You know, when someone can call any time when they're in crisis, uh, you may not be really able to help them much, but just listening to them, uh, we, you might help them. Like, for example, I know people have called me and maybe at, at midnight and they tell me, um, I, I am so bad, I feel like I am in panic or I'm, in, uh, I'm experiencing anxiety attacks. And, and I feel like I'm going to die and um, I, I'll commit suicide, something like that. So I might begin in a simple way. Um, are you alone? Uh, who are you with? So as I hold on this conversation, somehow I'm distracting them from their, their, their focus, like which is the stressor 
or whatever it is that is causing the panic, a little bit they are focusing on me, on what I'm telling them. So once there is no supply of fear, once there is no supply of panic or anxiety, they are likely to stabilize even as I talk to you. So I will ask you, are you alone in the house, for example? Uh, have, you, have you been able to get out of the house today? Um, um, you know, is there anyone that you can reach out to? All these conversations, you know. Uh, I would try probably even to survey, like scan what is in the house. Is, is this someone who really is uh, licensed, maybe a gun owner? So you, you, you need to get all that information. As you do that, somehow the person relaxes and ultimately you're able to help them. Sometimes I've seen people who tell me, I've, I haven't gotten out of the house, I've not eaten for two days, I've not even showered. So when they say such uh, information, what you do is, the first thing is, you start with the first, first thing first. Get them out of the house, let them eat something, let them take a shower. So as they focus on eating, taking a shower, and probably think of getting out, they are already somehow getting back to normal. And so it, this is another way that we can help people. Of course, therapy, it should be available for people to reach out. It's expensive, uh, ultimately, because of course also psychologists are not trained for free. Uh, I, I know sometimes <laughs> people want to, to be helped for free. When we can, we do pro bono. But remember, like this office, I pay for it. I went to school, so maybe I took a loan to be able to study. So maybe I'm still paying that loan. So uh, it's, it's a professional work. So it might be talking and people think it's talking, but it's a scientific way of talking. A way of talking in a way that you can get someone where they are, you can get to know the cause of their issues and then work with them until they recover and they heal completely. So uh, therapy should be available for people so that they can come and get supported. Um, uh, the other way of helping someone with suicide or is having a strong support system. I'm trying to imagine someone who is alone, maybe an orphan, there is no member of the family who exists, you're all by yourself, and then you're in this problem. You have even no friends. What will happen to you? So having a, a support system, either intentionally you yourself or some people around you can gather and support you. Like there are friends who have brought their own in therapy. They say, our friend is suicidal, or our friend uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is alcoholic, or our friend is a mentally sick. We want you to help, we will pay for that. So having that kind of support system, it really helps a lot. Or even friends that you can open up to. You know, I usually ask people, do you have that one friend that you can, you can completely open up to? Like, allow me to say this, like you can be naked in front of them. Like everything, nothing that you're hiding. Can you, do you have that such a friend? If you don't, I think it's an investment. It's something you can think about before the end of the year. Make sure that you have someone that you can open up to, slowly by slowly, people that you can trust. I'm saying this, of course, with understanding that um, some people have gone through abuse. Some people have gone through relationship and friendships where probably you shared something and then it was broadcasted. Yes, I am aware of that. But again, with the proper and slow discernment, you are able to tell who is a good person that you can open up to uh, and share. Uh, I usually say don't have friends who are there because they want something from you. Uh, those people, when you don't have that which they want, they will not be there for you. But someone who values you for who you are, that means whether you have or you don't have, they will still stick with you. If you're mentally okay or not okay, they will still stick with you. Have a strong support system. And this is where also family needs to come in. And when someone says they are suicidal, it's not a criminal thing. I know in the government and the system, the legal system, if someone has an intention of committing suicide, is a crime. Uh, but I think it's time we change the narrative to tell also it's a state of mind. It's not just because you sat down and wanted to die, but it's a state of mind. If someone is, is really uh, interwoven uh, with a lot of mess that has happened maybe in their lives, and they don't know how to deal with that. So as a society also, we need to change the narrative of, um, of suicide. As in, when someone says I'm suicidal, we need to see them as someone who is saying, I need help. And spiritual help, particularly if you're a prayerful person, you, have, um, uh, you believe in God, for example, in this case, that's something that we take lightly, and especially many psychologists who won't think of that. But uh, I have found people who have gone through so much in life, and you ask them, how did you survive? And they tell you, God helped me. God helped me. Or someone tells you, I'm going through so much, but I have hope in God that I'll, I'll get through, out, through this event. Now, when someone tells you I have hope, I can tell you that someone who is not depressed. Because you cannot be depressed and be hopeful at the same time. You cannot have this mental illness like uh, schizophrenia and at the same time you actually have hope. Unless there is another source of your hope. Because your source of hope is not on your, your, your ability. 
is now on another level, which is now believing in God, for example, knowing that he can help you even if you can't help. Because the helplessness you experience is so much that you feel like you can't be rescued or redeemed. But if you believe in God, you believe that God is higher than you, he has more resources than you have, he is able to work in ways that you cannot understand, but somehow he will help you. Or even experiencing the love of God, that God loves you, uh, you feel like even if the whole world has rejected you, even if you you are, you are found yourself in a very shameful situation, you know that he is willing to welcome you and to forgive you. These are simple concepts that actually I really encourage people to work on. And even prayer, being able to sit down to do something. You know, we are talking of helplessness whereby you have tried to stop the intrusive thought you can't you have tried to wake up you're not able to you try even to bathe the baby you feel like it's a it's like digging of you know digging a hole one acre of lard you know that put into a very helplessness kind of a situation but the moment you say let me pray for my situation it's almost like there's still something more i can do and so that prayer also is uh, is another thing that is very helpful and also i know where they are genuine um Christians or Muslims or religious people, they can come and join with you and support you even as you go through what you're going through. And ultimately, as I conclude, I would want to encourage you to tell you that uh, whatever it is that you're going through, you can find uh, healing. You can find a way of managing. Whatever it is that you're going through, you can find the help if only you can speak up. If only you can reach out to someone and say, this is what I'm going through. Maybe to a therapist maybe to a psychiatrist, maybe to a, just a general doctor, maybe to a pastor, maybe to a sheikh, maybe to a family member, maybe to a friend, maybe to a teacher, whatever. Just speak up, open up, and then the moment you share, someone probably will find a way of helping you. Sometimes it's not you to find help, some other times it's other people who can come on board and help you. That's what I want to say about suicide. So as we celebrate this month, I, I want to pray and, and, and at the same time, to wish healing for the families that have lost their loved ones uh, through suicide. It's a very, very, very painful uh, uh, pain, I mean, and grief and a human experience. And if you need the help, you can come to us, Amazon Counseling Center, we'll be able to support you. You can find us on social media. Uh, we have a website, uh, amazoncounselingcenter.com. Uh, you can look for me specifically, Silas Greener, on every social media, and you'll be able to find me and probably will find a way of working with you and supporting you. We are not here to judge people. We don't judge people. We don't form an opinion about you. When you share with us, we pick you, where you from where you, you are. We support you until you're able to be on your feet and you can move on with your life without uh, looking for, uh, for us anymore because you can now manage your life. Someone asked um, whether we send is hereditary. Uh, there are many schools of thought in that. One is a spiritual school of thought. And the spiritual school of thought basically uh, quotes mostly the Bible, which says that our grandparents or our forefathers ate the, the, the unripe grapes and now we are suffering the bitterness on our teeth. Uh, telling you that something that happened in the past kind of can be transmitted uh, into uh, future generations. Uh, yes, there is that. Why? Because, for example, if someone commits suicide and you know they committed suicide, already they planted the idea of suicide in the mind of children very early. So as they are growing up, they are already predisposed to suicide as a way of exiting if there are struggles in life. But also, there are chemical imbalances. If, for example, you're going through a medical, uh, let's say, a mental problem like um, bipolar disorder, and you are very suicidal, bipolar disorder can actually be transmitted from a parent to a child. So if, if parents already were bipolar, maybe both of them, actually 50% of the children are likely to also have a mental illness. Not necessarily a bipolar, but they could have other mental illnesses. And you know it is from mental illnesses we are getting the suicidal uh, thoughts or suicidal ideations uh, and all that. So it can be. Another school of thought is the biological school of thought, whereby the chemicals in the brain somehow uh, predisposes you to um, lack of resilience that you're not able to bounce back when you face struggles in life. And, and so because of these chemicals, when you face problems, maybe in life, you realize actually you're easily thinking of suicidal. Another school of thoughts uh, would be, uh, I think also spiritual, where there are uh, curses and all that, it can be traditional, it can be also uh, spiritual, whereby there are curses that have been passed from one person to the other, and these curses actually can uh, present themselves in form of uh, suicidal thoughts, and where people are talking of demons, spirits, and all those other things. 
uh, because as we are not completely uh, eradicating the spiritual perspective. Uh, it's something that we have uh, standard, it's something that we, uh, we have proved that also there can be suicidal thoughts that are coming from a spiritual perspective. So those are the schools of thought that are there. Uh, so if you want to reach out to me, you can uh, call me on 0725-242-740, Silas Grinya, and I will be able to work with you and support you. Thank you.